Chapter 3, verse 15. I don't know if she got those in. Hey, ladies. Wow, this looks wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Giving up your Saturday. So, I think all of you realize we have t-shirts in the back. If you didn't get a t-shirt, please get a t-shirt. If you uh, didn't get a t-shirt, Suzanne will be happy to make you another one. <laughs> make you one, sure, right? Pick up another time. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Sarah, for all the hard work that you put into doing this, for making the t-shirt. So uh, a little rundown of what to expect today. I want you to listen for a word that you're going to hear a little bit. We're going to have some worship and praise. We have a couple of us speaking, and we have Brenda back here um, that lives between here and in Enola. I found that much out. That's going to be our special guest speaker today. We welcome her and her friend today. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, we're going to go get downstairs and have a wonderful meal prepared by Sarah and Eric. Woo, woo, woo. Healthy food that nourishes our body, right? And um, then we're going to have some fellowship and some socialization time. I think Brenda will be speaking to us again. There is uh, no charge, no cost. All of this is just because we love to get together and we're women, right? Uh, there will be a free will donation box in the back. Uh, so don't feel obligated, we're just so happy you're here. Because to bring something to the service that is dynamic, that's fun, and spirit-filled is what we're all striving to do with our own unique talents and our own unique approaches. Yeah. Now people that know me know that I usually bring a lot of stuff with me, right? And they just kind of expect <laughs> that I'm going to bring a lot of stuff with me. Where's my crown? Yeah. I got one last year. You yeah. did. <laughs> You never know. The midnight day's not over. Thank you, Jesus. Does that make you uncomfortable sometimes when Nathan puts the scripture up here and he stands here? I get a little uncomfortable thinking, did I pull up the wrong scripture? You know, what's, what's the problem here? Is this a wrong version? 400 years of silence. It's called the silent years. From the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew. No prophets, no prophetesses. No messages from God were given. How do you think that made the people feel? They had experienced the miracles of God. We now understand that the grace of God was a, abundant mm -hmm. in that period of time as well. True? They felt like God had forgotten them. They felt like he had forgotten their promises. Go ahead and put that passage of scripture up. It was during this period of silence 
that we see people in expectation. I keep saying the word expect if you haven't picked up that word yet. Now as the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John whether he was the Christ. Well, I don't know about you, but to come at a time after 400 years and being in a spirit of expectation is kind of like being on your tiptoes. What's the Lord going to do today? That's what I'm asking. What is the Lord going to do today? What are we expecting Him to do today? Well, I get so many ideas when I go into people's homes to clean. My first thing, I told Suzanne, I don't think I can talk because, and I started sharing all these ideas I had with her. And it's like, and I don't know where I'm going with any of them. Well, every house I go to, my poor Shan, my poor Tracy's like, Mom, I come out, I'm like, I got another idea while I was, she's heard so many sermons. Mike was praying for her last night, and I thought, he has no idea how many sermons this girl has heard the past two months. Because every house we go to, it's like, I got another idea. My idea today is I was watching, I wasn't watching, I was cleaning. They were watching the show, The Price is Right. Well, the best part of The Price is Right is, and Sarah Underberg, come on down. and we have tax here so we had to add that in plus I had to add my little wrap woohoo alright two left alright Leah oh, yeah. bid on this one uh, 225 225 on that one? nope <laughs> <laughs> um, 226 <laughs> 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 lower Okay, you bid the lowest, so you get this one. No, she bid the lowest. Oh, 325, 326. You get that one. All right, well, open them up anyhow. <laughs> we have to move faster. I'm, I'm too slow. Oh, and Pete. All right. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Well, 
today, I'm telling you what. Woo! I don't know if you guys saw my little do my granddaughter last night, but this is how she walks. She walks on her tiptoes. Did you guys see that last night? She runs on her tiptoes. I'm telling you what. When Mike sets the atmosphere, I feel like he's on his tiptoes almost every Sunday, don't you? God's looking for people with expectation. He's expecting him to pour out his spirit. We're expecting him to do the impossible. Expecting to see the dead raised. All the stuff Nathan keeps talking about. Expecting pain to be gone. Expecting cancer to be gone. Right? Expecting that addictions are going to be gone. Yes. That the doors of opportunities are opening up every day for us. Amen. The opportunities to witness to people. The opportunity for financial breakthrough. Uh, for success. Expecting greatness. Sowing an expectation. Praying an expectation. I tell you what. It's tiptoe time today. Right? Yes. You know why? Let's see if I can do this. Many of us have had bears in our life. And we've already slain them. We've killed the lions. But today, I'm telling you what, it's time to pick up your rock and pick up your stone and pick up your sling. Careful. <laughs> I'm not good at this. Hey, don't worry. It's not going far. You get the idea. It's time to pick up the giants in our life and to defeat the giants of self-doubt of so low self-esteem, of depression, the giant of anxiety, the giant of broken heartedness, broken dreams, the giant of bitterness, yep. the giant of anger. Yep. You name your giant. But you know what? After he defeated that giant, he didn't just leave that giant laying there. He came back and he beheaded that giant. He detached. It's time to detach. It's time to get on our tiptoes. Yes. There's other people in the Bible that had great expectations. There was a lame man that came. And every day he says he came to the temple. And there was Peter and John. And here yes. they come. Now, he didn't, where's my hope? hope. He didn't hope. hope he didn't it. think. You need it? Nope, I just need you to hold it up. <laughs> he didn't believe. You got believe too, don't you? There was a reason that I had all these and everything came all together here. Suzanne, thanks for letting me open. <laughs> this is not even my speech yet. Okay. <laughs> I tell you what. Yeah, he didn't think or hope or believe, but he came with expectations that they're going to give him some change, right? But they came with the expectation of silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Right? They came with great expectations. Zacchaeus. You can put them down. Thank you. Zacchaeus came. He went up and climbed up a tree. Why did he do that? He had expectations to look for Jesus, didn't he? Amen. He did. So, I'm out of breath already. <laughs> it's with expectation that we all come today. We're expecting to slay giants. We're expecting to detach ourselves yes. from those things that have helped us bondage yes. mm -hmm. and to help other people understand how they also can. Amen. See, the devil isn't afraid of our past. He's afraid of what we haven't yes. done yet, yes. what we haven't conquered yet. The greatest miracles, as Nathan says, I mean, this is what he's been telling us. Just, I always do it in a different way, same message. So I'm saying, look with assurance. That's what expectation means, assurance. Anticipation, because the best is yet to come. So whether you're on your tiptoes as we worship the Lord, whether you are or whether you're not, remember this. The Lord loves you yes. lavishly. Yes. He's not as stingy, strings attached, but a love that stretches beyond the stars, yes. far into eternity. And He wants to sweep you up in His yes. arms. Yes. He wants to scoop you up. Yes. And He wants to softly say, You're mine. I approve of you. I love you when you're afraid, when you're frazzled. I delight in the way you flavor the world. I talked about that last time, being the light. He delights in the way we light up the world. I love the way you thirst for me. I love your humbleness. Matter of fact, you're a star. I love your quirks. Even your quirkiest quirks. Yeah. I guess this is my quirkiest quirks. 
used to say how much fun I have with my grandbabies. <laughs> we have a zoo out on our porch. I mean, uh, I love the way you trust me. I love your imagination. I love the way you trust me. I love the way you follow me. Worship team, please come. Right now, I love the way you're going to praise me. And let's do this with expectation. Whether you're sitting down and you're on your tiptoes or you're standing up and you're on your tiptoes. Let's go and worship the Lord and expect nothing but the best. And what we get received today, we're taking out to the world. In Jesus' name. Turn this back off. Well, how many of you know there's no coincidences in the Lord? Yeah. <laughs> the first line of our first song. Since we can move mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation. We're waiting here for you. Glory.
just so thankful, God, that you have called us all here today. Lord, we know it's not by accident that each one of these ladies are in this room. We know, God, that there is a hunger and a longing in us, Jesus, that keeps us <coughs> expecting things, God, that your word tells us is true. We just thank you, God, right now, Lord. We thank you for all the unspoken things in our hearts, Lord, that we already know and see accomplished because you are in us. It can't be anything else but accomplished because you are in us. Thank you, God, for that reality, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed all these speakers today, God. Be with us as we continue through this, Lord. We will give you all praise, glory, and honor in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So again, thank you all for being here. Can you hear me? Am, am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, last time I spoke at the last women's conference, which was in the spring, I kind of gave a background of, of me and when I was saved. And I'm going to do that again because there's new faces in the room. But <clears throat> at age 13, I was saved. And... I'll always be thankful for that man that came down in the middle of a slumber party that I was attending. And it was her dad, and, she, and he sat there with all of us. There were probably five women, or five girls in the room. And he was bold enough to ask us all, have, do we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? And at the time, I really didn't know about it, um, I was raised Catholic, so I didn't really know what a relationship was. So, at that moment, all five of us gave our lives over to Christ. And since then, <clears throat> move on, five years down the road, I got married at a young age. And still married to the same man, but my walk hasn't always been like I thought it would be. Thought, okay, Christ now is, is in my life leading me. My marriage has been challenged on different occasions. My health has been challenged. My financial area, my finances have been challenged. And I just thank God for what he has revealed to me in this day. I can't remember how long ago uh, Toby and I have started attending this church, but Nathan um, took it over, I don't know, Sally, what year it was, maybe. Um, long time. <laughs> and he, um, he was honest enough to say, the Lord told me, if I didn't open this Bible up and read it in a different light, not that it's different, but in a different light, there's a lot of uh, things that we have taken out of context that has maybe set us back, maybe. But he started preaching the grace of God. And that all things have already been accomplished because of Jesus Christ at the cross. So that's kind of where my, um, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, in lines with. And it may not seem like it's geared around women, <laughs> but um, God created mankind. So he hasn't moved me from what I have wrote down here, so I believe it's somebody in the room has to hear this. So he actually gave me this mes message maybe a month ago, and I kept thinking, oh, if Nathan asked me to preach, I'll get up and preach this message. But um, uh, Suzanne asked me to talk again today, so I believe it's for today. So, so God's mes message to me was this. Do you realize he wants you in complete surrender to him? He wants us to completely surrender to the ministry of grace because therein lies the power. I feel like sometimes we as humans try to help God. We feel like we have to have our hand in it. 
do things to help him. When in all reality, he wants you to surrender and be in a peaceful state. The message I'm going to share today revolves around this surrender. But first, the Spirit wanted me to look up what each evangelist, how each evangelist viewed Christ and his entrance into the world. And what each evangelist symbolizes. I believe he wanted me to do this because even though we may have different points of view and we are on our individual walk with him, his ultimate plan for all of us is that he wants he and I to be one. He wants us to be one with him. He wants to be our savior, our father. Our, he's our creator. So God with us, so we are one. So Matthew. Matthew is symbolized by a winged man or an angel. His gospel starts with Joseph's genealogy from Abraham. Matthew's gospel represents Jesus' incarnation and so Christ's human nature. This signifies that Christians should use their reason for salvation. Matthew viewed Jesus as compassion and forgiveness. In Matthew 1.21, it explains, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Matthew viewed Jesus as his, a savior. Matthew 1.23 says, And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So God with us. In Mark, Mark is symbolized by a winged lion, a figure of courage and monarchy. The lion also represents Jesus' resurrection because lions were believed to sleep with eyes open, a comparison with Christ in the tomb. And Christ is king. Mark's gospel signifies that Christians should be courageous on the path of salvation. Mark viewed Jesus as a man of action. So in Mark 1.8 it reads, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So God with us. Mark 1.11 says, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my son, in whom I am well pleased. So Mark viewed him as sonship, father. In Luke, Luke symbolize, is symbolized by a wing ox or a bull, or bull, a figure of sacrifice, service, and strength. Luke's account begins with the duties of Zacharias in the temple. It represents Jesus' sacrifice and his passion and crucifixion, as well as Christ being high priest. The ox signifies that Christians should be prepared to sacrifice themselves in following Christ. Luke viewed Jesus as fate and free will. So in Luke 1.32, he describes Jesus as, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father, David. So sonship. Luke 1, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. So a savior. And we get to John. John is symbolized by an eagle, a figure of the sky, and believed by Christian scholars to be able to look straight into the sun. John starts with an eternal overview of Jesus and goes on to describe many things with a higher Christology than the other three Gospels. John's Gospel represents Jesus' ascension and Christ's divine nature. This symbolizes that Christians should look on eternity without flinching as they journey towards their goal of union with God. John viewed Jesus as the divine incarnation of God. In John 1, 9, he describes Jesus as the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 1, 12 says, To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become, the, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1, 14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, that, that glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So from Matthew to John, we hear some of the same points of view of who Jesus is. A Savior, a Father, He's God with us. However, when we get to John, the symbolic of the eagle, he uses words like true light, power, full of grace and truth. So being full of something means this, containing or holding as much or as many as possible, having no space, no empty space. So Jesus had no empty space because it was filled with grace and truth. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. 
When Jesus walked the earth, he had one mission. And we, being his children, should have the same mission. Here's what that mission is in John 4, 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Our mission in this life is not to live out our agenda. Instead, we need to live out the will of the one who sent us. Say what we hear the Father say. Jesus' ministry was full of compassion, declaration, and truth. He said in John 4, 14, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. God's love for humanity is so profound. He used Jesus to speak to those who were hurting, those broken body, those abandoned, to give them hope. Yes. To give them a chance to drink from the water of everlasting life. Over and over, while Jesus walked the earth, he was asking people to lay down their life and follow him. Completely surrender to their own way of thinking, viewing, and assessing their flesh and just trust him. He said in John 5.20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works, and these that ye may marvel. So God wants to show us in this time the greater works. But we have to surrender and let him show us those greater things. We always marvel at the fact, or at least I do, that Moses was there when God split the sea. I mean, my, math, now my natural mind can't even conceive of it. So you walk up, staff down, because God's telling you, and this vast sea rolls back, and they walk through on dry ground. Or when Peter walked on water, yep, he stepped right out of a boat, and he walked on water. This seems easy, right? But to step out of that boat and walk on water, I can say amen, or I can say yes, I believe, but actually walking on water. Again, our minds in this day would tell, my mind in this day would tell me otherwise. Or how about Daniel? Thrown into a lion's den. And not one lion opened its mouth to touch him. Then there was Jonah, who actually lived in the belly of a great fish for three days. He breathed, he lived in that belly, and after three days the fish spit him out on dry land. Now, do we believe in this room if we were swallowed by a whale, God would keep us breathing? You know what I'm saying? It's like we have got to get to this place where we are in complete surrender and trusting him to move us through different things of our lives. Or how about the three that were thrown into the fiery furnace? It's recorded that the people that, there were, that were there couldn't even walk up to that furnace or they'd be burned up. But these three came out without a mark on their clothes. And my favorite while of the Bible, when Ezekiel came up onto the valley of dry bones. In chapter 37. Sorry. I'm just thinking, man, we got to get here. We got to get to where we completely trust in these things. Not worry about our life's challenges. In chapter 37 of Ezekiel, the Spirit of the Lord asked him, Son of man. Can these bones live? And, he, and Ezekiel answered saying, Oh Lord God, you know. And God told him to prophesy to the bones. Once Ezekiel opened his mouth and commanded the bones to live, they lived. Bones came together. Bone to its bone. Sinews, muscles, tendons on the bones. And flesh grew and the skin covered them. Then Ezekiel prophesied to the breath. And breath came into them. And the bones came to life and stood on their feet, exceeding great army. I mean, I mean, wow. <laughs> A bunch of bones. And those people in those times only had the spirit hovering them. As Jesus said in John 5, 20, greater works will we do in his name that we may marvel. And all those, all those people that I mentioned... They had to go through a, uh, a second or whatever you want to say of a surrender to God to say, yes, I believe. To me, that is a surrender, an example of surrender. We now have the spirit living in us 
The very same spirit that made those dry bones live lives in us. God wants to show us great and mighty things. In this time, so the world will know him and his power. He wants us to have complete trust in him and his unconditional love for us. That he will do greater things through us than what he even did through those people yes. that have gone before us. Amen. The spirit that we've kept under our skin, so to speak, is longing to work miracles through us. Yes. He's longing for a complete surrender of your flesh and for you to take him by his hand so he can lead, lead you. He wants you to know that you are the righteousness of God because of Christ. And Christ is in you, the hope of glory. So because Christ is in you, you are the righteousness. Because Christ cannot be anything but righteous. So when you look to Christ, the author, the finisher of our faith, you surrender to self. We need to lock eyes on the Savior at all times, in all situations. We are on a verge, I believe, of a mighty breakthrough. The enemy knows it. And he wants to keep you hiding behind your flesh. You need to constantly declare to him the truth of God. In John 6, 40, it says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. God will raise us up in the last day. He is seeking for those who he can raise up in these times. Once the surrender happens, he is then able to work through you. It's like he explained to Ezekiel after the dry bones became an army. The Lord described to Ezekiel that the bones are the whole house of Israel. And that their bones are dried up and their hope is lost. But God brought life to them by telling them he would open their graves and make them come out of their graves, his people. He said he would bring them back home to the land of Israel. Then they will know with confidence that he is Lord. He said he will put his spirit in them and they will come to life and he will place them in their own land. Then they will know what the Lord has spoken and fulfilled it. So the places that we feel have been dry bones. Remember, you have a better revelation than Ezekiel ever knew. God sent Jesus to fill those dry places, but you have to surrender to him and then prophesy or declare to the dry place that it lives. Jesus brings life to it. The great light of the world lives in you if you have him as your savior. So there is nothing impossible because of him. God did not withhold anything from Ezekiel when he was looking at that pile of bones. The Lord simply asked if he believed that they could live. At that moment, Ezekiel surrendered to God and then believed. Once Ezekiel was in agreement and declared, bones became an army. And God is no respecter of people. What he did through one, he will do through anyone that will believe him. Again, he said that we will do greater things in this time. Jesus Christ died on the cross that we might walk in fullness of him. He laid down his life so that you could be empowered to walk in the spirit. Leaning on the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you. He wants to be glorified through you. How humbling is it to know that the great I am... <laughs> sent his only begotten son to die a horrific death so that we could have him indwell inside our being and walk in his power. Not only does he want to indwell in you as your Lord and Savior, but he wants you to walk in the power of his might. The stories that I shared with you regarding Jonah, Daniel, Ezekiel are not just stories. They were real life events that happened through the average man. God worked through these people to bring hope. To inspire us to know that he is for us. To encourage us to fully surrender to the spirit of his son that is in us. So that we too step out and do the mighty works. The Bible tells us in John 6.51 that Jesus is the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. So earlier in John 4.14, where Jesus was saying that those who seek him will never thirst. So now he's the living bread and the water. He's food and drink, consuming us. With him we should not thirst or hunger. He wants us to understand that he consumes our being. We cannot fail if we have him. 
Stepping out to allow him to work through you is a constant reality that the Holy Spirit wants you in. You are ordained before the foundation of the world. He loves you. He formed you in your mother's womb to live in this time. Because he knew we'd be the people that the true gospel of grace would be preached. And we would carry the baton to the finish line. He loves us more than we can even imagine. It's truly an everlasting love. It's not based on human performance, rights and wrongs, but solely by what he did for you by going to the cross. He's in love with us, ladies. He's in love with us. Do you know how the word of God defines love? Apostle John said, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. That is the Bible's definition of love. It's not about our love for him, but rather his perfect love for us. As opposed to conventional love, belief, true repentance from the heart results from a revelation of God's immense and unyielding love. It is not found in laws, judgment, indignation. When Peter saw Jesus' goodness and love for him, which was when he blessed Peter with a boat sinking, net breaking load of fish, Peter fell to his knees in total surrender of, of Jesus. Our Heavenly Father is waiting for us to give up on our own efforts and surrender to Him and His perfect grace and love. I read an analogy that I'm going to share, and it said, Before a lifeguard attempts to rescue someone who is drowning, he will wait for that person to give up on his efforts to save himself. If the person is struggling with his hands flailing and his legs kicking everywhere, a well-trained lifeguard will not go close to him because he knows that he will be pulled down with him. So even though the lifeguard wants to save the drowning person, he cannot until that person has exhausted his strength and gives up trying to save himself. And then the lifeguard immediately grabs hold of him and brings him to safety. So it's a surrender, complete surrender to our Father. When we surrender, when we quit kicking and flailing our arms, kicking our legs, as our own self-effort, we'll be in His safety. When you're in His safety, you're under His blessings, His love, guidance, and peace. Because it's not about you anymore. It's completely about Him. It's His ministry that we want to share with the world. It's not our agenda, but His ministry. So I just want to end with some... Uh, powerful women of the Bible that surrendered to him and when they did healing either physically or emotionally took place so the woman with the issue of blood the doctors couldn't help her she'd spent all her money so self-effort Bible says that the minute she touched Jesus virtue left his body so he instantly knew when the woman touched him in Mark 5 it's 25 through 34 um, it says and a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things and many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard Jesus, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may just touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, Thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. So she fell down before him, a form of outward surrender. Before he declared her healed, she surrendered. So she fell at his feet, and then he said, Daughter, thy faith had made thee whole. The Samaritan woman at the whale. This is in John 4. This woman had a past that she was terribly ashamed, ashamed of. At the well, when she said that she had no husband... Jesus didn't call her out and humiliate her. Instead, knowing that she was self-conscious and insecure about her background, he, command, 
he commended her twice by saying, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have five husbands, and the one whom you have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. He sandwiched what he already knew between two compliments. You have well said, and then at the end he said, In that you spoke truly. So Jesus must have spoken to her with so much compassion and love in his eyes and with no judgment or sarcasm in his voice that it caused this woman to let down her defenses and open up to him. Surrender. By the time she left his presence, this self-conscious lady who once feared meeting people because of all the gossip going around about her was so occupied with Jesus' love and acceptance that she became an evangelist of Jesus and his grace. She went back to the village and testified about Jesus to the very people she had been terrified of before. And the Bible records that many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. Once she surrendered, he was able to love her into a forgiveness that she embraced. Mary and Martha. Martha was all about work, work, work. Luke 10:42 describes, One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. When Jesus was in the home of the two sisters, Martha and Mary, Martha was busy with much serving. Mary, on the other hand, was seated at Jesus' feet, listening to his words. After a while, Martha got angry and said to Jesus, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus' response to her complaint was this, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken from her. He gently rebuked Martha and defended Mary. But he didn't, Jesus didn't rebuke Martha for her much service. He showed her how she was worried and troubled about many things. Jesus told Martha that one thing is needed, sitting at his feet, and listening to his words. Mary was in complete surrender. And I'll end with this scripture. It's in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And it's out of the Message Bible. It says, Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. And work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitted on you. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So the unforced rhythms of grace. What it means is there is an ease and an enjoyment when you walk in His grace. This is in contrast to the struggle and strain found in self-effort. There is such rest when you know there is nothing you can do to earn his forgiveness. Give up on our own self-righteousness, which the Bible describes as filthy rags, and with open arms and an open heart, receive his forgiveness, his grace, and just surrender. I know it to be true because I've done it in my life. Uh, like I said before, when I first started out, many challenges have come my way, and I just, you got to let it go. Give it to Him. It's the beauty that's in us, <laughs> which is our comfort, and it's Jesus Christ. So, thank you. I don't know who's up next. Sheila? Okay. Good. I do. I do. That was great. Thank you, Joey. Understanding who we are. Aren't you glad for how God made each one of us so different, and yet we have so much to share in our own very unique ways. And I'm glad I have grandchildren, but even before I did, I still had a bunch of toys at home. <laughs> I 
everybody take your fingers, pretend it's a slingshot, get your rubber band, pick up your stone, release. Yes, release. That's what we're doing this morning. We're releasing, right? Well, <clears throat> I thought about the Proverbs 31 woman and talking about her, but I figured somebody else would. So I'm not going there. But if you want to know about the Proverbs 31, I have a couple copies, and you're more than welcome to find out all about her. <clears throat> okay, young ladies, come and help me. Pick those up and just start scattering them around. I only have a few. Give your sis one more. I don't know how many you have. Just start scattering them. Yeah, that's, that's fine. What are they? You're a valuable asset to God. Like a snowflake, every one of us is unique. My question is, who are you allowing to define you? Right. See, we put labels on ourselves that often are not correct. Right. Then we allow others to define us. Mm -hmm. I have two grandchildren, as all of you know, one and two-year-old. I declare my one-year-old is going to be the leader because every time that she does something, Jayla imitates her rather than the opposite way. Leah has a scream that's out of this world. So now Jayla imitates this, ah! and we can be in the store and if one's screaming, then suddenly you have, for no reason, just because. <laughs> you know, they say it only takes about five to seven seconds for someone to make their first impression of us. Right. It's not very long, is it? <sighs> is it accurate? Oh, a lot of times not. You now, when I met Brenda, man, I wanted to start asking her a whole lot of questions. But instead, I diverted myself from asking her questions, knowing she was going to speak and had a lot to share, to what do you do and what your occupation is. That's pretty much a safe subject, wouldn't you say? So I diverted what I wanted to ask her <laughs> into a whole different subject. So, <clears throat> people define us by our clothes. They define us by our looks. They define us by our body weight, our characteristics. More than once, people have come up and asked me if I'm gay. I'm sorry, I'm a big woman. But no, I love my husband and I love my children. And from the time I was a little child, I was playing baseball and football and all the other balls with the boys. Uh, the dolls, my mother would come home and she would have all my dolls dressed in new clothes that she had sewn. <laughs> I could have cared less about the dolls. They didn't mean a thing to me, but my baseball did. My football did. I get offended. I've been called sir when I used to have a little shorter hair. Uh, <laughs> but people do define us, oftentimes without even knowing us. All I knew is I wanted to be a mommy someday. So what I'm going to do is illustrate a little different. My approach to beauty is a little different because we need to understand that we're loved by our papa. Nice. Right? And in order to do that, we need to realize how much he loves us. So many people, I'm just amazed when I go into homes to clean. People that are in their 60s and 70s, still are looking for acceptance from their parents, still looking for love. When we realize how much God loves us, that's when, you know, we can really begin to, wherever my star is, we can really begin to shine. Okay, girls, who are these? Where is that from? Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. Don't we all love Winnie the Pooh? We have a couple of different characters, and unfortunately I don't have Eeyore. I just have a couple of the other puppets. Eeyore, perpetually depressed. 
His cup is always half empty. He's always going to spot the dark cloud instead of that silver lining, right? Doesn't have very much initiative. He's gloomy and sarcastic, pessimistic. He's a whiner. He'll pretty much drag you down if you hang around Eeyore very long. But then we have Tigger! Don't we all just love Tigger? Why do we love him? He's pouncy, fancy, trouncy, full of fun, 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 full of bounces. He's got a spring everywhere we go. Don't we love the Tiggers in our lives? Yeah. He's hyperactive, he loves playing detective, and he prides himself on never getting lost, nice. right? He's not afraid of failure. He's cheerful, he's outgoing, he's optimistic. And he's confident. We could go on and describe the best friend this is really his best friend. Piglet is, be his, is his best friend. Uh, Winnie the Pooh I'm talking about. But I'm not going to go through all those characters. But every day we wake up, we get to decide which one we're going to be. Yeah. Even when our day's not going as planned. Remember, first, God loves your story. Yes. From the creation and foundation of the world, He created you. So, therefore, He has written your story. He knew every twist of the plot and every unexpected turn, didn't He? He knew every freckle. When my little girls were young, they would try to decide if this was a freckle or where they began and where they end. I don't know. I have no idea. He has every hair of our hair numbered. He knows every joy, every sorrow, and he promises you the happiest ever after. Yes. So God loves the treasure of you. Deuteronomy 14.2 The Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. Who likes treasures? Yes. Ever been on a treasure hunt, scavenger hunt? We went on a little one this morning and you guys got some presents. Hey, they weren't very much, but hey, you know what? It was fun, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Gold and silver, rubies, sapphires, diamonds, they cannot compare to how precious God sees you. Yes. yes. No comparison. But I just went to the jewelry. Linda used to work at K Jewelry. What is some of the most expensive jewelry you sold in price? And how much were they on the expensive end? How many thousands? Five? Eight? Twenty? I don't know. I don't have that kind of money to... Huh, huh. Wow. But you're worth more than that. Worth saving. Worth every drop of his blood. See, God loves the beauty of you. Song of Solomon 4.7 says, You are altogether lovely, my darling. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find all my stuff down here. <laughs> There's no flaw in you. You ever look in the mirror and say, <laughs> I mean, I look and it's like, man, I need a face left. Where'd this double chin come from? I don't get this anymore. I don't recognize this person. I'm saying, you know what? The world has a definition of beauty what it's supposed to look like. Throw it out. Yes, Toss it in the trash heap. Yes. Put it away. Yes. Because the true definition, you just said it. The beauty is only found in the one, so look in his mirror of truth. Yes. Yes, Lord. I have four beautiful daughters. Not that I'm biased, but I think I do. And I look at John and I and I say, wow, how did I get these beautiful young ladies? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody ever seen my daughters? They kind of think they're kind of pretty. I know your kids are too, but you know, it's a mom thing. But it's so funny when I go out because there's sometimes when I, I, I've been out and here's the guys and they'll go. And I'm like, look out, that's my kid. <laughs> oh, you're pretty too, mom. They have to justify. You know what? You are breathtaking. 
jaw dropping, yeah. heaven and heart stopping, beautiful. Yeah. Say, I am beautiful. I am beautiful. The Bible says you're a workman that needs not to be ashamed, created to do good works. Uh, my kids are just beginning and now I've got some crayons that we go upstairs when we go to the tub and we're drawing on the tub. Hey, their work of art is pretty. Who has some of their kids, Rita, on the refrigerator? You got some artwork? I mean, they're scribbles. I don't know how to do anything. Man, they're so pretty. <laughs> That's the way God sees you as a work of art. I'll be back. <laughs> Say, I am awesome. I am awesome. I'm terrific. I'm terrific. And the Lord sees me doing a great job even when I don't. Yep, He does. Yeah. True? True. Amen. So, how much stuff do you have, Sheila, right? <laughs> well, today I brought an onion with me to use as a visual. I mean, I really like onions because they add flavor to my food. When I cut open this onion, the tears start making me cry. And man, it smells up my whole house. What are you guys thinking right now? You think I'm a little confused? <laughs> but I'm the teacher. I know. So I can call this an onion if I want to. I can tell my grandchildren this is an onion, and when they're two years old, they'll say, Mom, can I have one of those onions that make me cry? <laughs> and then they're going to wonder where the tears are. Right? doesn't matter who gave you that label. Your parents, your teachers, your first boyfriend, or even those who bullied you, those who used you, those who have abused you, that's what you're going to be talking about, right? It matters how God labels and defines us. That's the label we want to recognize and see. You want more? Okay, let's see how the Lord describes us. I find this very, very interesting. Rita, make your way up here for me. <clears throat> We're going to the zoo, zoo, zoo. You can come to, to, to. We're going to the zoo. Okay. To see the birds. <laughs> Who goes to the zoo to see the birds? Oh, we have one in the house that does. Tracy loves to see the birds. I have parents at home. Okay, well, do you, do you go to the zoo to see a sparrow? Would you go to the zoo to see a sparrow? Probably not. No, probably not. Just to watch them eat some insects. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some bugs. Yeah. Some seeds. I mean, if I'm going to the zoo, now I have lots of elephants because... Uh, because that was what Jayla's room was decorated as. I mean, her favorite thing to see is a, she says, a long neck. So what's she referring to? Giraffe. giraffe. She fed the giraffes. She loves the giraffes. If I can get on YouTube and I can watch giraffes. And so we have long tongue. Oh, they can reach through the top of the trees. Long neck, long legs. That's what she calls giraffes. Long neck. If I was going to the zoo, I'd probably want to see something a little bit more fun. Well, let me read this passage of scripture to you. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, Nathan said this the other day. The bank has an opinion of how your, what your value is, your boss, your friends. But God says you're worth more than many sparrows. So I had to figure this one out because that made no sense to me at all. See, in the Old Testament, you was required to have sacrifices. So you would have a goat or a lamb, right, to bring forth as a sacrifice. However, if you had no money, 
or very little money, you could buy sparrows for a farthing. Actually, a pair of sparrows for a farthing, which is about a penny. So they were about, worth about a half a penny. But they're cheaper by the dozen. You could get five spar sparrows for two farthings. Now, let's read the characteristics here. It, it, the Lord just has such strange ways. Really? I mean, come on. I'm not going to the zoo to watch that, but I might an elephant because I really like an elephant. Come up here and read this so they can hear you. Here's the characteristics of an elephant. She demonstrates leadership through her wisdom, strength, and her extraordinary skills in problem solving. Social intelligence, openness, decisiveness, patience, confidence, compassion. Now isn't that a lot more fun of, a, of an animal? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you rather be compared to an elephant? Yeah. Or something, an eagle? Uh -huh. Other than a sparrow? But that just goes to show me that God sees none of us, none of us as small, as insignificant. There's all kinds of songs about not elephants, but about sparrows, not a sparrow falls that he doesn't take note of. Uh, what's the song? Yeah, his eye is on the sparrow. Isn't it amazing that God sees what we don't see? And he takes this little small sparrow and he calls us and says, you are of more value. So don't ever think you're insignificant. Right. Don't ever think you're too small that the Lord doesn't see you. Right. That the Lord doesn't know you. Right. Don't ever feel like you're of no value. I like this one. A woman who fears the Lord will never be anxious about anything. She will do what God has appointed her to do. The Bible says God loves a gentle and quiet spirit in a woman. Well, I started thinking about that, but I guess I better not talk because I'm not a quiet woman. And then I realized he didn't say a quiet voice. He said a quiet woman. So there's a difference here. She's not argumentative. She doesn't have a contentious spirit. She doesn't demand her own way. She's peaceful and brings peace in the middle of chaos. A quiet spirit, not a quiet voice. That gives me a little bit of, okay, I'm okay, all right? You're okay too because we have a lot of verbal women in here. So, when we have a peaceful spirit, we can soothe that crying baby calm a toddler's boo-boo, listen to that heartbroken teenager, Amen. be sympathetic and loving to our elderly parents that may have dementia, Alzheimer's, unable to walk, unable to feed themselves, unable to take care of themselves. Some of us have been in there. When we have a quiet spirit and a gentle spirit, we can bring peace and chaos. She's confident the elephant is confident. In the time we now live, women want to be independent. But what does God say? Just the opposite. I want you to depend on me. I want to be your strength. I want to be your I want to be your I want to be your help me. Name some adjectives. Name some. Help me. What does dealer defender. So God wants our confidence in Him, doesn't He? A woman shows good judgment. She's gracious. She's kind. She's practical. I said I wasn't going to go through Proverbs, but you really can't go through and define us as beautiful without some of these adjectives, can you? She's morally strong. She has the power to resist all allurements, intellectual strength and physical strength as well. <clears throat> Are these your notes or are these my notes? <laughs> Here we go. She cares for the needy, submissive, not in competition with men. I see so many women who are in competitions with their husbands. 
we're not supposed to be in competitions. I'm much more vocal, as you all know, than John. You don't even hardly know he's around, and it's so funny when I've had different people come into my home and then I'm not there, like insurance agents and whatnot, uh, uh, you know, just people that come into your home and they see me, people that sell in this room, and they're like, I wondered what his wife was like. <laughs> I don't know whether to take that as a compliment or not because he doesn't say very much. And you know, you just have to grab words out of the poor guy. I never know what that man's thinking. And here I am, blah, 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 blah. And you don't want to know. <laughs> but God understands our values and our strengths and he appreciates them. What is this? What? It's a water bottle? Hang with me. Participation helps. You want me to be done today? Wine glass. If it has my name on it, thanks to my kids. Yeah. These are all vessels, aren't they? Something for us to drink out of. I don't know what this one is. I already forgot. Okay. They all look different, right? Yep. According to what you put on the inside. Am I probably going to drink wine out of this? Probably not. Am I going to probably put some coffee in this? No. Nah, probably not. Sarah, what do you have in your thermos? Uh, it was kombucha, but now it's coffee. Coffee. Yeah, this one's kind of, you know, this one's kind of like, uh, yeah, hot or cold, right? So, just like all of these vessels, we need to realize our uniqueness and not try to be like someone else. Don't try to be like me. I don't know where all these ideas come, but they never stop, I can tell you that. And I, I have a really hard time at night time shutting my brain off. And I get up at 2 or 3 in the morning and rewrite this script because I thought of something else. Be thankful your mind don't work like that. <laughs> uh, I just went to the house and I cleaned for a, a, a very well-to-do, uh, her husband's an orthodontist and he has quite a few clinics around and they have a beautiful, beautiful home. So when I came in the other day, she's like, Sheila, I have to speak at my church and I don't know what to do because I have to come up with an illustration. <laughs> oh my goodness. She asked the wrong person. So here I'm cleaning the counters and it's like, I got it. And I was like, I got it, Susie, I got it. And then she left and my mind's still rolling after I've given her something. It's like, I got two more for you. <laughs> she used them, so that was great. I, <laughs> she's like, man, how do you do that? I'm like, don't even ask me. I have no idea. Have a servant heart as we reach out daily to the, those that the Lord puts on our path. <clears throat> well, I was cleaning another house. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, take, it doesn't take very much to clean a house. It's just pretty much road over and over and over and over. So my mind has to go somewhere, right? Otherwise, I'd just be brain dead. So I was at this other house and I saw this cup. And on it, it says, To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Malachi. 6 8. Then it said, It's a man thing. So to me, I thought this guy is implying that's the kind of woman he would really like to have in his life. One who does what Malachi says to act justly, that means just to do right, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Do right and be kind. I mean, it, that's what it really sums up to be, right? So it's true. God loves all of his creation. I, I, I'm just amazed at that, you know, it's not only us he made beautiful. He made food beautiful, Sarah. If you take a carrot and, and cut it open, inside it looks like a, an eye, the pupil of an eye. Are carrots good for your eyes, Sarah? Yes, ma'am. If you take a piece of celery, 
It looks like your limbs. And it's good for your bones. Right? I mean, you can go on. There's like 16 different foods. A walnut looks like your brain. <laughs> We're all women here, so you know what a grapefruit looks like and what it's good for. <laughs> now I'm getting a little too explicit. But God see. <laughs> Hey, did I say we came to have fun? God looks inside of each one of us, and I told you, He sees stars. Nice. Isn't it amazing what God did with the simplest things? Yes. I mean, it just never ceases to amaze me. My poor daughter, I should have asked you guys when you went to Florida. I sent her way out of her way as she was going, uh, I don't know if some of you knew, uh, J Jayla and Andrea went to, uh, out to the uh, west coast to see Shannon um, and spent five days out there and had a wonderful time. So I knew that it was beauty within and the first thought I thought of, you know, beauty and the beast, right? The second thing I thought about is the beauty inside of the seashell and with the legend of the story of the seashell. We have the uh, five stars, which point to the uh, stars that led the wise men to Bethlehem on one side. On the other side, we have the poinsettia. Okay? We have the Easter lily. So we have the resurrection story. We have the birth story. We have the four points, and this is, this is called a, a keyhole arrowhead. This is the only kind my daughter went like 10 miles out of her way to four different stores looking for this, or three or four stores, looking for me a sand dollar. Bless her heart, thank you. <laughs> and this is the only kind she found, which I find very, again, unique. Because usually we think of sand dollars, we think of them as round, right? I didn't even know this kind existed. But we have the four points which represent the, the uh, nails that were in Jesus' hands and in his feet. One, two, three, four. We have the spear that pierced his side. Who's got peace? A plate that says peace? That would be who? Lee. Uh-oh, come here girls, you got to help me. Alright, so what's inside the sand dollar? There's little doves that are inside. Has any, anybody ever seen this? The dove is representative of peace, of joy. God takes His creation and they are the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest of little doves. Look at our windows. Why do we have doves on our windows? Have you guys ever looked at this? Does it create an atmosphere and a sense of peace, of joy? of the love of Jesus. Has everybody seen this? If not, take them around and show them to the girls. Show them to the people that maybe... Anybody want to see the doves inside? Yeah. They're beautiful. God thought of it all. Man, He thought of it all, didn't He? Who can, who, who can duplicate this? Yeah. Who can duplicate His love for us? Who can duplicate, wow, what He wants us to be? God loves the way you shine. Again, I tell you this, and I know I'm being redundant and re repetitive, but he says you will shine among them like, it says lights in the sky. Well, what's the lights in the sky? They're stars, right? You will shine like lights in the world. I loved it last week when Don shared Delaney's success. What did she win? Anybody remember that story? She, her opera singing. Yeah. Isn't it great to have success? Remember when my kids used to go play soccer or baseball or gymnastics, basketball, whatever they did. Man, I'm on my feet. Woohoo! She's mine! She's mine! That one's mine! She made a goal! She's mine! You know, Jesus is thumping his chest and he's saying, She's mine! She's mine! Light up the world! She's mine! Amen. God bless you. We'll just clean up. Next speaker. You have a
open? No. I'll turn it off. I'm actually not our next speaker. She actually ran down for a little break for, for a second, but um, I was not planning to speak today, but this morning, oh, hey, just in time. Um, the Lord told me to talk about Esther, so I'm just going to take two minutes, and um, it's so funny because I feel like Esther has always been portrayed as an obedient woman, right? But I feel like religion says that Esther was obedient, but grace says that she trusted the Lord. There's a difference. Do you see the subtle difference? Because obedience, I feel like we're told to be humble and be obedient, which, which we are. But there's a difference between obedient and having a taskmaster over us. That Obedience from joy or obedience from obligation is very different. Um, doing something because we're in a relationship and because there's that foundation of trust and love. Obedience is not something you have to work at. Obedience isn't even part of the thought process. It's doing something out of love and out of a heart that's full. And I feel like sometimes some of the beauty of Esther gets lost in the translation. And last night uh, we had Eastern Gate House of Prayer. And as we were, we hadn't even started yet. We were just talking before the service. And I said I felt like today was going to be a day of soaking. And so I don't know how many of you know the story of how Esther and the other women in the king's harem prepared themselves. They had literally got one night with the king. And if he was pleased with them, he, would, he was choosing a queen at this point when Esther was going through the process. But um, for a year, it was a year of preparation that these women would endure for one night with the king to try and please their king. And if he didn't like them, they went to live their life with the other ladies that were discarded in the harem. And they were just kind of around in case he ever wanted to call them back. Some of them spent literally one night with the king their entire life and then lived with the harem. But Esther, um, so part of the process of this year of preparation, right, this season of preparation, they would soak in fragrant oils. And so I felt like today we were soaking in the fragrant oils. And when you soak in fragrant oils, pretty soon you just walk into a room and your skin just emits a fragrance. You don't need perfume. You don't need to spray anything from designer or from Walmart. You just emit a fragrance. right? And so I want you ladies to know that when you leave today, you're going to be emitting a fragrance of the love and the beauty of Jesus Christ. Um, and so with that, I'm going to have Sarah come up. I just wanted to share that briefly. Jeff? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so I had uh, stuff prepared for this about a month and a half ago. And I said, this time I'm going to be more prepared. I'm going to write something out. And I had all these beautiful ideas in my head. And I was going to have props. I was going to have props. <laughs> I said was. <laughs> um, but while Sheila was speaking, um, I, I ran downstairs because I just kind of felt God prompting me to do what I just did. So, um, a little backstory about me. Um, I, uh, I'm 44 years old. I just had a birthday on Saturday. <laughs> I have two children, my uh, oldest. Uh, he is 23, and my youngest is 19, and so I am an empty nester. Uh, my husband's birthday was yesterday. 
Um, he's, he's nine years older than me, so he robbed the cradle, technically. So, um, I, was, I was born to um, a, a teenager, to an 18, 17-year-old teenager. Um, and she married my biological father. Try to stay with me, because this is like a lifetime movie. Um, she married my biological father because they figured that was the right thing to do back then in 1973. So they got married, and uh, it was the first of many, many mistakes. Um, and he was abusive, and he drank. And so my mother left him with me and took me to my grandmother's, my Mima's. And my Mima raised me. I mean, with my mother, but my mother was in school and she was working and trying to take care of me. But as long as I can remember, I was always told that I ruined my mother's life single handedly. <laughs> and after a while, it doesn't. It doesn't bother you anymore because um, you, don't, you don't look at yourself as a citizen. You look at yourself as a second-hand citizen. And um, I have to say, though, I was, I've never been mad at her. It's, it's not her fault that she is the way that she is. She can choose something different. She can choose a different perception, and that's what I chose. The bottom line is I could have been what she was. Um, she was very verbally abusive. She was very physically abusive. Um, and she was, she was a petulant child raising a child, essentially, is what it was. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I, I looked at her and I didn't get mad at her. I just looked at her and I decided I was never going to be that. I don't know what I'm going to be or how I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do this. So, um, growing up in this life, my, my biological father left us, or my mother left him, and he decided that the best thing for me would be to sign away his rights so that this crazy woman could raise me uh, with my grandmother, thank God. So my Mima helped raise me most of my life. Uh, my mother remarried when I was three or four, and that is my dad, and he adopted me. And when I was seven, they had my brother, who uh, is the golden child of our family. He can do no wrong. Um, and it took me a long time to find my voice because, and here's my prop, okay? Okay, this is what I identified with. Can everybody see that? That's, that's who I thought I was. Now, being in a home where you are verbally and physically abused a lot, you really don't want to be there. So you look for anything that you can do or be a part of. So I can't tell you how many churches I went to. Tons of churches. Just to get, just to get out of the house on Sunday morning. Just to get out of the house. Just to not be there. Not have to deal with, you know, cleaning the bathroom wrong and having to redo it 14 times. Um, and so... I, I grew up going to churches, but I grew up with religion. I mean, that's what I grew up with. And it wasn't until, um, I'd probably say about, wow, 10 years now. Gosh, that's forever. 10 years ago, because I feel like it was just yesterday, actually. Um, I, was, I was actually on the phone with my husband. Well, we weren't married then, but um, I was on the phone with him, and... Um, we oftentimes talked until our cell phones ran out of battery. And back then they had like cords this long, so you're like this to the wall, you know. Um, and it was at that moment in my life that I decided that Jesus was the man for me. So um, he prayed for me over the phone. And I, I had this 
I was like the Joker. I couldn't stop laughing. Like that's all. I mean, I was laughing hysterically, and I was almost embarrassed about it. But I'm like, whatever. I'm just gonna roll with this. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the first time in my life that I that I noticed right away that God was gonna use me for something big. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my daughter was homesick with strep throat, and she had a fever that would not break. It would not break. It was like 103, 104. Wouldn't break. No matter what I gave her, wouldn't break. And so um, I was telling Eric on the phone, I was like, I have the weirdest feeling going through my body right now, and I don't know what to do. And I'm laughing while I'm saying all of this because I can't stop laughing. Um, I'm like, it's my fingers. It feels like there's like fire running through my veins all the way to my heart. And I said, and it's the same with my feet. Like, I am so hot. I'm so hot. Anyone who knows me, I'm never hot. I'm freezing all the time. Um, and so he said, you need to go into Maddie's bedroom and you need to lay hands on her head. And you need to say, I am not doing this. She is going to wake up and she's going to be healed. And so I was like, well, this seems a little ridiculous. I'm glad nobody's watching me. So I went into her bedroom and I laid hands on her. And uh, three hours later, she woke up from her nap and she was fever free. And her throat didn't hurt and her ears didn't hurt. And she was totally fine, bouncing off the walls, just like normal Maddie. Yeah. By the time my son got home from school, I apparently was still on fire because I went to give him a hug and he like pulled back like I had just smacked him. And he's like, Mom, your hands are so hot, they feel like they're going to burn me. I was like, well, this is cool. I hope this lasts for a while. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you'd think after that experience, I'd kind of turn myself around and, and uh, you know, do what's right. What's right, what we, re what we deem as the right thing to do as a Christian, to do what's right. Well... I told my husband the other day that I broke the mold when I was born and there is not another one like me. And, um, and that uh, I think birthdays are very important. I'm sappy, mostly because I like gifts. But um, I really like my birthday. And my husband thinks I'm kind of funny because I, like, I love my birthday. I love it. It's like a national holiday and I don't know why the rest of you don't celebrate it with me, okay? Um, but my husband's birthday is, you know, like right after mine. So his was yesterday, and he, he got up in the morning, and I'm like, Happy birthday! It's your birthday! And I'm so excited. And he goes, Yeah, okay, dear, whatever. <laughs> and, and I looked at him, and I said, You know, you should be very excited for your birthday. This is a big deal. And he goes, No, it's not. And I said, Yeah, it is. And he goes, Why is it such a big deal? And I go, Because it's the day God decided you should be born for me. <laughs> I'm like, you're my gift on your birthday. So, um, anyway, so birthdays are a big deal, and um, I didn't realize, probably, and this is no joke, I did not realize until probably a year ago, because I've been coming to this church a year and a half about, about, yeah, um, I didn't realize who I was. I mean, I knew I was Sarah. I know I'm Mary's daughter. I know I'm married to Eric. You know, Sandy's my mother-in-law. My brother is Nick. You know, I'm, I'm good at making art. I'm, I'm this. I make sauerkraut. Um, I make pickles. I make kombucha. When I'm at the farmer's market, I'm the kombucha lady or the sauerkraut lady. Like, that's who I am. That's who I am. But um, I had kind of uh, an epiphany shortly after I started coming to this church, which, by the way, I did not want to come back to this church. Just want you all to know that right now. I did not want to come back. I came the first time, and I looked at Eric, and I said, I ain't going back there. Mm -mm. I'm like, did you see that those people wave flags? <laughs> Who does that? What is this? And I was sitting in the back, and I remember Mike was in the back, and he's like, he said something and it just startled me and I'm like, who's, who's talking behind me? The minister is up there. <laughs> but that's because I was raised in religion. Yeah. And um, 
I think it actually works better for me because I really didn't really have a real church to like compare this church to. And um, and I, I kind of came at it like, well, you know, oh, okay. But the Lord told me I was coming back. So I came back. Yes. I love this church. Yeah. <laughs> the, re- <laughs> the reason I love this church is because when I am in here, and not just when I'm here, but it's a, it's a great reminder of when I'm here, is that the Holy Spirit is in me every, everywhere I go. In everything that I do, in everything that I say, in every life that I touch, in, in, in everything that I do. And this is the perfect place for me to pour out my excess. Because I know, I mean, I can't, I can't give it all away. There's not enough time in the day for me to do that. So this is a great place for me to do this. However, um, it helped me realize really who I am and whose I am. And that is more important than all this junk yes. here. Yes. Because this isn't me. Look, second one, right? This is me right here. That is me. And um, I, I'm sorry, I am royalty. And I'm going to act like it. Yeah, that's right. And it's not, not because I'm better than anybody. It's just because I know who I am. Yes. That's who I am. Yes. And um, I <clears throat> expect yes. big things. I expect miracles. <clears throat> I also expect to be able to do those things, too. Yes. Um, I had kind of a whole different thing I was going to talk about, but it ended up being this. <laughs> but for, um, I've got to have a drink. Not many people know this about me, but um, I used to practice Wicca for seven years. <clears throat> and the day that I left started probably the worst two years of my entire life. <laughs> <clears throat> Anything that bad that could happen to me, happened to me. And... Um, <clears throat> Clearly, Satan doesn't want me to tell you this, so. <clears throat> but I will tell you, since leaving that, I've probably experienced the best in my life. Um, I've had the best experiences, I've mes- met the best people. I'm, I'm, <coughs> I wouldn't say that <coughs> I was happy that I went through that part of my life, <coughs> but I'm happy that I went through that part of my life. Yeah. <coughs> you want a or a now, <laughs> when my daughter was uh, four years old, I was in a band because I was cool, you know. And uh, I was driving back in the snow in a brand new car. I'd never driven in the snow before. <coughs> and um, I literally hit a train going 65 miles an hour. The train was going 65 miles an hour. <laughs> I couldn't stop in the snow. And so I hit in between lead engine number one and lead engine number two. And the police showed up, which of course I got a ticket for failure to yield at a railroad crossing. <laughs> he said, I've never seen anything like this. And he can't believe that I'm just standing there. I literally hit the train. I was going about like literally eight miles an hour. I'm not even joking. I just couldn't stop. Um, the train kind of sucked, tried to suck me in between the two engines. And as it was barreling down the tracks, it spun me off. And I spun around in half a dozen circles. And I ended up on the opposite side of the road, facing the opposite direction I was going, on top of a snowbank. I opened the door. Because at this point, I'm like, 
Everything's good. Nobody saw that. I'm fine. <laughs> I, I get I get out of my, my, my brand new car, which I have to say is the very first vehicle I ever paid full price for. And like I paid for it. I paid outright for it. So I was really proud of this vehicle. I turn around and I'm like, oh, wow, wow. What's, did that even happen? I turn around I'm like, oh my God. Point, my brain is still thinking, yeah, just drive off. Nobody even know. Yeah. Now, so uh, the only thing that actually happened to me besides my vehicle being totaled was I had a bruise on the top of my right foot from where I was pressing on the brake so hard that it impact my foot slipped under the brake and the brake hit the top of my foot. That's all that was wrong with me. Wow. It's the only thing. Um, my vehicle was totaled, and the uh, yard that they towed my vehicle to, they were like, I can't even believe that you lived. Mm -hmm. Well, I lived because of, the, well, of course, because of Jesus. However, because of the vehicle he kind of led me to pick out was a Dodge Intrepid, had a very huge front end, very big engine, and it's what saved my life. It's what saved me from being sucked in between two engines and being, you know, like a sardine, but dead, yeah. deader. Um, you know, you'd think after that, I would have done the right thing, but I didn't. And I kept continuing down my, my spiral of bad choices, um, terrible decisions, life-changing decisions, and, um, <coughs> But I will tell you, I can look back now as a different person now, mm -hmm. and I can see in all of the ways God saved me. Oh, <laughs> just the things that happened to me could have been like, like bad, like like bad, like life changing, life altering, bad. But every every single turn. He, God was always there. And so, looking back now, I have this attitude, kind of, um, that I'm a big deal. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a big deal. I'm a pretty big deal. I'm a pretty big deal to God. Yes. And um, I don't think that I was saved from a train, like, I can't even believe that it, that it happened to me, but it did. Um, so that I could live a mediocre right. life. Right. Right. I was created for a purpose. Yes. Yeah. I was created for greater and bigger things. Yes. Bigger than even I can imagine right. or dream of. Right. And so, I guess what I wanted to really get out there and I'm not sure if I have or not but no matter where you come from no matter what your background is no matter who your family is um, no matter what you've done no matter what you didn't do uh, no matter how you responded or didn't respond um, none of those things matter to Jesus not one thing not one thing, not one of those things matters to him. The only thing that he wants is you. And he wants you just the way you are. And once you can fathom that you can be as screwed up as you can be. You know, I was a witch. And Jesus wanted me. Like, he wanted me. He, he came to me right where I was at, and he took me the way that I was. And I guess my point is, if he can do it for me, I mean, he can do it for anybody, because I'm the most screwed up person I know, so, you know. And he, he loves this beautiful mess, and he loves all of you, and he accepts all of you the way that you are. And um, I guess the, the end of this is, uh, you know, you're worth it. You're worth love. You're worth the love.
from the man. Yes. The best yes. man ever. Yes. You're worth it. Yes. Um, I, your Eeyore, I heard that while I was downstairs. I heard that. Because I got, I, this is who I, I used to be Tigger on the outside, but Eeyore in my heart. And uh, that's only something that you can keep up for, I mean, not that long before it takes over, before you either let the darkness take over or you decide to be the light. So, you know, I always told my kids, use your power from, for good, not evil. Right. You know, and in my book, using your power for good means loving mm -hmm. and accepting. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, those are all the things that we want. Right. That's all we want. Right. We just want love and we want right. acceptance. Most right. of all, we want love. Right. We want love right where we're at. Right. In this beautiful, hot mess. Yes. That's what we want. Yep. You know? Hair not done, sweatpants on, slippers on. You know, you haven't bathed in a couple of days. Whatever. But God, that's how God wants you. He wants you in that beautiful hot mess because he, he made you. He created you. He chose you. And um, that's pretty, that's a very... Uh, it's a very deep thought if you've never thought about anything like that before, because I've never ever thought about anything like that before in my life, ever. I thought, this is my life. I need to do whatever I need to do just to make it through this day, because tomorrow's going to suck even more than today did. You know, what can I do to get by? How can I do this? How can I do that? Because I didn't, I didn't really have a family that supported me. Um, it, was, it was really difficult. Because I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to be a great mom. I had no idea how to do that, though. So, um, because when I was pregnant with my son, my parents disowned me because I wasn't married. And I was 20 years old. And so uh, my Mima, God love that woman, stepped in and, you know, taught me how to change a diaper because I didn't have any idea how to do any of these things. And um, my son was eight weeks premature. And the day before they were going to send him home with me, I was like, I was telling the nurses, I'm like, wait, wait, you don't understand. I, um, um, I can't do this. Like, I'm not, I'm not qualified to do this. I don't know how to do any of this. And they're like, well, you're going to figure it out. And it was the most terrifying moment in my life when they were sending home this baby, this itty bitty tiny little baby home with me. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But uh, God was very kind to me on my first child. <laughs> the second one, well, <laughs> that was a funny joke. Um, <laughs> but he gave, me, he gave me a son that was very good natured, very easy, did not cry, did not throw fits. <laughs> hey, me. <clears throat> But I think it's because he knew that that's what I needed. I needed a soft, gentle baby in order to teach me how to be a soft and gentle mom. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, get me ready for the second one four years later. <laughs> that would challenge everything in my fiber. So, yeah. um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how you end. How do you, how do you end? You don't. You don't. There's no way to end. I mean, because our stories go on forever. Yeah. So. Um, I will, I, I wrote, I have one other half prop, kind of, if I can get this off without ruining everything. While I was looking up quotes from my office, I love to have scripture around me all the time in my office, and I work for myself, so I can put anything I want on my wall, so yeah. I came across four really fabulous, simple scriptures. Um, Psalm 46.5, she is enough. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Just the way you are, you're enough. Proverbs 31:25, she is fearless. Yes. I like that. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes me feel like, you know, come on. <laughs> bring it. Mom. <laughs> Isaiah 40:31, she is strong. Yes. So I know a lot of us we don't feel strong a lot, but with God we are. There's nothing more powerful. And 2 Samuel 13:28, she is valiant. 
when I, when I read these, I just think of like, I'm just like this awesome, strong, like warrior princess riding on a horse with my shield and I got my sword and I'm like, bring it. Come on. Come on. It's like one of my favorite t-shirts Suzanne really likes. It says, not today, Satan. So, uh, not today, Satan, or any other day. So. Um, be blessed, everyone. Be blessed. Well, my name is Brenda Long, and I am the founder and the executive director of Garden Gate Ranch, and we will get into that in a little bit. But I want to thank Sarah and Suzanne for inviting me and allowing me to come to speak to you amazing women. It's always very humbling to know that the Lord has asked me to stand before his beautiful daughters and speak his words. You know, we can maybe put that in a... Just think if the president called you and said, I want you to come and speak life into my children. Well, you know what I mean? Right. So anyway, so it is so Holy Spirit that so everything everybody has said so far was part of what, what the Lord has, you know, had me put down. It's part of what, you know, the passion of serving this population of uh, women. So it's so cool. You guys will kind of see some uh, threads of that. And so I wanted to just kind of give you a few minutes just to take a breath. There's been a lot of fire hose stuff going on, and it's been pretty amazing. But you started out with expectation. So we're going to play a song here in just a second. And I want you just to soak in the song. But I want you to take the time and say, God, what is it that you want me to walk out of here with today? Let God take care of our house while we're taking care of his house. And today, right now, at this time, you're taking care of his house. The temple that he gave, Holy Spirit, here on this earth, through you. So know that Whatever's going on at home is being taken care of. The Lord's there. Holy Spirit's there. So let's just take a few minutes and listen to this song.
We belong to Him. Everything He asks of us is because we belong to Him. And it's really not an ask. It's an invitation to partner with Him on something amazing. Because everything He does is amazing. So I'm here today to talk about human trafficking, and that's not a very attractive subject. However, it's necessary to bring awareness to it. And the first part of my presentation is really just going to be about human trafficking. Um, I made this mistake at one presentation, not really even to talk about human trafficking. We just talked more about what we could do to help. And a gentleman at the end said, can you explain exactly what that is? <laughs> so I realized, and I should know that not everybody knows, because there was a day not too long, a couple years back, that I really didn't know what human trafficking was. But so I just want to start out just real quick um, of who I am. I'm a wife. I'm married to Steve Long. We've been married for a little over 27 years. Uh, him and I both had previous marriages before, and I had three. I have three children from my previous marriage. I was a teen mom and a teen bride. Um, had all three of my children before I was 21 years old. I am um, so I have three children: two sons and a daughter. I have three stepdaughters. And we have t collectively 20 grandchildren and one great-grandson that I think absolutely hung the moon. <laughs> um, I was born and raised in Iowa, truly realized into this human trafficking uh, journey how the true statement is I was born and raised in the cornfields of Iowa. Because there's a lot of stuff that goes on out there that I was totally unaware of. I have five brothers and two sisters, one and who came with me today. Uh, my uh, career by trade is I'm a realtor. I'm also a real estate investor. My husband and I do a lot of rehabbing. And because of rehabbing, we are landlords. And um, we were foster parents for 13 years. I was a CASA worker, which is a court-appointed special advocate for children at risk. Uh, for a year and a half, I volunteered at a safe home for young women at risk. I'm a licensed minister of the gospel, and I am the founder and the CEO of Garden Gate Ranch. Uh, I also realized, you know, I, when I, I got born again at the age of five, but then I never lived for the Lord. I didn't know I could. But the woman who led, me, led most of our family to the Lord was a missionary, and I think I was afraid I'd have to go to Africa like she did. So it's like I run, you know, it's like I'm, I'm a retreater, so I ran. But then I realized I am a missionary. My mission field is modern-day slavery, domestic human trafficking. And specifically sex trafficking is what we're going to talk about today. So what is human trafficking? It's modern day slavery. It involves the use of force, fraud, coercion to obtain some type of labor, labor or commercial sex act. And there's numerous types of uh, trafficking. There's sex trafficking, labor, debt bondage, uh, forced marriage. Mine wasn't, but <laughs> a teenager you would think that. Um, domestic servitude, organ trafficking, which is pretty heart-wrenching, uh, forced child labor and child soldier. All of those in which happen in the United States, except for one that we know of, and that's the child soldier. Um, I have hotline numbers if anybody wants them, because I recommend that you have at least one hotline number in your phone for when you see something that d looks out of the ordinary that you make that phone call. We don't have to know it is trafficking, what law enforcement want to know is what looks out of the ordinary. And there's a lot of things that can look out of the ordinary. So um, indicators of human trafficking. Uh, recognizing the keys and indicators of human trafficking is the first step in identifying victims. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to go through this kind of fast. Um, so, does a person appear disconnected from family, friends, community organizations, or houses, house of worship? Has a child stopped attending school, or are they sleeping in school? 
Maybe they're sleeping in school because they're not a bad student, but because they're up all night servicing someone, many someones. Or how about the adult that constantly is late for work or sleeps at work or misses work a lot? Has a person had a sudden or dramatic change in their behavior? You see a, a young woman and she seems to be pretty with it. She has a job. She pays her bills and all of a sudden she's not taking care of herself. She's missing work. Her car gets repoed. What's going on? Why? What happened? Is a juvenile engaged in commercial sex acts? Is the person disoriented or confused or showing signs of mental or physical abuse? Does the person have bruises in various stages of healing? Is a person fearful, timid, or submissive? Does a person show signs of having been denied food, water, sleep, or medical care? Is a person often in the company of someone to whom he or she defers or someone who seems to be in control of a situation, like where they go and who they talk to? Not that long ago, I got a phone call from a friend of mine and her daughter was at Merle Hay Mall. And she noticed these two young women and this older gentleman. And they were going into stores that this teenage friend of mine's daughter was in and so they were looking at jewelry and then in some of the stores at some um, clothing that was maybe not appropriate for the age. And she noticed this guy hovering over them, watching, and he clapped his hands and those two young women went running to him. And he said, it's time to go. Later, she saw them at another store, that very same thing, and I said, okay, I have six children, I've had foster children, and 21 grandchildren, and I can clap my hands and not one of them yeah. come running. No. Just saying. Yeah. What was that? She was a brave young woman. She actually, it ended up they were leaving them all at the same time. She jumped in her car, she watched where they were going, and she went over and took a snapshot of the license plate. And so my friend's calling me like, what should we do? I said, call 911 and tell them exactly what you saw. Mm -hmm. Of course, investigations take time and I don't know what happened. But at least somebody saw something. That's one, that's some, right there, a, an incident. Did it, is that normal? Do your children run when you clap? <laughs> no. Uh, does the person appear to be coached on what to say? Is a person living in unsuitable conditions? Does a person lack personal possessions and appear not to have a stable living situation? Does a person have freedom of movement? Can the person freely leave where they live? Are, they unreasonably, are there unreasonable security measures? Now again, not all of these indicators is, yes, it's trafficking, but at least it's something to ask the question. So I'm going to give you some global stats real quick about sex trafficking. There's an estimated 27 million, let that sink in for a second, 27 million young boys, young girls, young women, young men that are being raped on a daily basis numerous times a day for someone else's profit. And I want to throw in here. We've had a misconception of prostitutes in our community, let's just be honest, or in our lives. And I used to have that attitude before, I, before the Lord did what he did in my heart. I, would, I know somebody personally that was arrested for prostitution. She was a stripper in a strip club and she got arrested and she was in jail at the time that I was made aware of this. And my attitude back then was, well, she chose that. And it's like, are we really that blind? Do we really want to believe that, a, let's just say, did that five-year-old little girl, when she was five, did she say to her mother, when I grow up, I'm going to be a stripper in a nightclub and be raped? Did she choose that? Do some women go out there and put themselves in a prostituted position and not a pimp ruling them? Yeah, sometimes they do, but why have they done it 
there's something in life that has caused them to make to think that's their only choice or maybe it's because she had been touched and molested ever since she was a little tiny girl and she thinks that's what her worth is and let's be frank how many have walked in the doors of our church and we turn our heads and don't embrace them I'm guilty of all of that there's an estimated 40 billion dollars a year in this criminal industry 40 billion can you imagine what God could do with 40 billion dollars in the kingdom just to put a little perspective on that that is a total income of worldwide McDonald's Google and Walmart wow. going into the hands of criminals that pay no taxes on that money to abuse our daughters our sisters our nieces and of course boys but again I minister to the women there's no exceptions for slave owners and that's exactly what they are you know we've put that word trafficking on them but that's really slave owner is what it truly is and there's no exemptions it could be a gang it could be a woman can you believe women prostitute other women pimp them out it could be a business owner it could be one of our teachers in the school and if any of us pay attention to the news we've seen it in the news not that long ago locally it could be a government official, a law enforcement, a judge, a doctor, our parents, parents of children. And actually, in the state of Iowa, and I'm jumping ahead, but in the state of Iowa, that is actually our biggest trafficker. It's parents selling their own children for drugs. Or it could be another family member. So, and there's no exemptions from victims. It's not a gender thing. It's not just women. There's young boys. There's young men. There's, uh, you know, the mental health piece of it. They're very vulnerable. Is, what about an age? Is there an age that this is exactly the time it happens? No. There's averages. But I've heard of as young as three months and as old as 80 there's no social economic there's no geographical demographic it could, it's everywhere what about our buyers who's who's out there buying these young people there's no exemptions there either they're not just the dirty old man down the street that's not just the homeless guy that goes into a homeless camp and rapes a woman even though those things happen but it's our business owners our government officials pastors the common labor farmers again women what about our notorious bachelor parties I'm 59 years old we grew up with that was what happened the men would go have a bachelor party and usually have some girls come in and dance and what about attorneys and doctors and youth workers and teachers and professors there's even in Oklahoma a case that was tried of the head cheerleader of a college was prostituting the other girls on the cheerleading squad so it's not that african-american guy that wears a bright purple suit with the big hat with the big diamond rings it's not I mean if they were if it was that easy to identify the problem wouldn't be there but it's white it's black it's Asian it's Hispanic it's every nationality I was talking to uh, a banker friend of mine one day about trafficking and he just sat there with his mouth open and he's like 
I was invited to a very elite breakfast club here in Des Moines by a gentleman that actually was a father figure to his wife. And they would get together once a month, they'd have a steak dinner, but then there was a party after that party. And he got invited one time. He would never go back. And the party after the party, and these were business people in our community. These are government people in our community. These are people that we vote in in our community. That behind closed doors, they had strippers coming and they had prostitution going on for hours. And he was appalled that this man who was supposed to be a father to his wife would invite him to be part of that. What father? Okay, so those are the national stats. So if you guys are like me, I'm like, okay, so trafficking is real. It happens, but it happens in Cambodia, right? It happens in Thailand. It happens in India, but it certainly doesn't happen in the United States. Well, I was wrong. You know, for some reason, human beings want to say it always happens to somebody else's family until tragedy happens to your family or your neighborhood. You always want to think it's somewhere else. But in the United States, there's an estimated 300,000 sex slaves right here. 100,000 of them are children under the age of 18. So again, let's put some perspective on that. So approximately every child under the age of eight in Iowa, set them all aside, that's the number. That's how many people in the United States is being prostituted. Every eight-year-old and under in the state of Iowa. Or how about this? The population of, collectively, Des Moines, Ankeny, Altoona, Waukee, and Johnston. If the whole United States and we took every person in those communities and put this big circle around them, all of them are being prostituted, sold, for someone else's profit, raped on a regular basis. But then you want to say, wait a minute, wasn't slavery, I mean, we're talking about slavery, right? They're doing something that they don't want to do. But wasn't that abolished in our country in 1865? Wasn't that, didn't that all go away? Well, you know, back then, the Underground Railroad freed our slaves. They did the right thing. They changed the laws and they freed our slaves. And now the Underground Railroad is enslaving. And they do that through the internet. They're imprisoning people behind closed doors, which is nothing but an Underground Railroad. It's the second largest crime in the United States, neck and neck with drugs. And it is soon to become the, the top crime in the United States. And why is that? Because there's low risk and high profit. If a drug dealer goes and buys drugs today and sells them tonight, he has to go buy drugs again tomorrow to make any money. But if he goes to the mall and he picks up some of our young people and woos them and takes them, he can sell her 45 times today and get paid every single time. And it's kind of like, I almost hate to say sold because usually when I buy something, I take it home. If I rent something, I have to give it back. So they're renting our young people. There's three, this one is so, I mean, this is also wrong, but this one just is so irate to me. There's three and a half million buyers daily. If we got rid of the demand, if the buyers would quit buying, would we even have the issue any longer? The overall age is 11 to 40 average. The children's average age is 12 to 14, and the overall age for young adults is 17 to 22. Again, three months to 80 is what I've, I have heard stories of. One in three girls and one in five young boys will be sexually assaulted before they're 18 years old. That sets a, set, a foundation of brokenness huge vulnerabilities. The lifespan of someone in the life 
the life is seven years. Many never make it out. And what percentage of people do you think are coming from other countries that are being prostituted here? Any guesses? 50, you said? 15, which means 85%. Because you know, again, it's not our kids, right? It's like, okay, it's in Cambodia, it's in India. Okay, it's in, it's in the United States. Well, then we want to say it's in Chicago, it's in Houston. And then we want to say, well, it's the Asian people that are being brought over or the Hispanics that are coming across the border. No, 85% are our children. Could be living right next door to you. Goes to school. I promise you, you have crossed a path with young people who have been trafficked. Every one of us. And my sister works in therapy. She's a licensed therapist. And when she first heard about trafficking, she, I mean, and, and this is overall, this happens all the time. Their heart breaks because they've had these kids and these young people sitting in their offices and did not know the signs. DHS says it all the time. Policemen, the police force say it all the time. So that's why it's important that you get educated. So yeah, so we want to say, not in the heartland, not in the bread belt of the United States, not in our cornfields. We're so, you know, we're so good here, right? We aren't crazy like the coastlines are. The East Coast and the West Coast, they can be a little crazy. But every given month in Des Moines, there's one approximately, and of course this goes up and rarely goes down, but goes up, 1,350 ads for commercial sex. And 945 of them are high-risk children ads. When there's any big events that come to town, like the State Fair, like Drake Relays, like the wrestling tournaments, like the Pork Expo, for God's sakes, the ads go up 400%. And it's not because of the State Fair is a bad thing. It's not because the Pork Expo is bad. It's not because the wrestling tournament is bad, but it draws a lot of people. And so these traffickers are coming from Omaha, they're coming from Minneapolis, they're coming from Chicago, they're coming from, you know, they travel and they communicate with one another. Like the pimps here, seriously, this is crazy. It's a business. So the traffickers here, the pimps here, when there's a big event coming right here in Des Moines, the surrounding areas, they know each other. They call and they're like, okay, you can come in my ter territory, but you have to give me X amount of dollars or a percentage or whatever. Online, there is, there's a website called backpage.com. I encourage you not to really go there because there's explicit pictures on it and you might get bugs on your, your computer. But back, it used to be Craigslist. They used to advertise on Craigslist, and, the, and they took a stand against Craigslist, and Craigslist... So what do they advertise for? I mean, what, how do they... Escort, escort services, okay. uh, massage parlors, uh, new girl in town. Yes. I mean, it's nuts. Yeah. It's nuts. I could show you some of those ads sometime. <laughs> so, exploitation of the vulnerable, that's what they're after. They want to exploit someone's vulnerabilities. These traffickers prey upon breaking down, the breaking down process to bring them under their control. And they do that through breaking down their body, their spirits, their soul, and their psyche. So I'm gonna just go through a couple. Um, Rebecca Bender is a survivor of human trafficking, of sex trafficking, and she has a ministry, and she's in Oregon. And she has actually interviewed pimps and the survivors. And she put together, it's quite interesting, so I'm just gonna read a few, maybe. 
But we all ask the question, why doesn't she leave? Because so many of these young people, they're not tied up. Some are, but our vision of Taken and some of the movies that we've seen that have magnified, it's they're t always tied up, they're always chained up, they're always gagged, they're always whatever. But like I said, we see them every day and we don't even know it. So how do we see somebody that's entrapped in this if they're, not, if they're chained, if they're gagged? And they're chained and gagged mentally. Mm -hmm. So one of our questions is, okay, so if she doesn't have chains on, if she's not behind 10 locks, and again, all of those scenarios do happen, but the majority is more mental, then why doesn't she just leave? So let's listen to a few of the traffickers and a few of the survivors. So he says, I would isolate her, breaking her ties with any support she had. I convinced her family and friends that I was the good one. The survivor says he met my parents and they really liked him. I met a young woman in Atlanta, Georgia, that very scenario. He went to church, he was on the elders board, he wined and dined the parents, and then he swooped in on her and, had her ca and kept her captive mentally for years. Another trafficker said, I would start a fight before she visited with friends and family so that eventually she just stopped visiting. What was her take on that? I felt too guilty about leaving after an argument. I was also too embarrassed for my family to see my bruises. So I quit visiting. Isolation. He's trying to keep her from telling anybody. Traffic, another trafficker says, I convinced everyone around her that she was incapable of caring for the children because of her stupidity, mental illness, and laziness. The survivor said, he convinced me that I would lose my children if anyone knew what was really going on in our house. So he used her children to hold her captive to make her do things she didn't want to do. Another trafficker said, I had her back me up in illegal things so that I could hold that over her head if she ever tried to leave. The survivor says, he would tell me that he'd turn me in if I ever tried to leave, and I feared going to prison. Another trafficker says, I'd make her doubt her sanity and capabilities. He said, I turned the kids against her by making her the bad parent and tricking the kids. I would make her hit the children by saying, telling her, it's either you do it or I do it. And if I do it, I hit them harder. And then he would threaten her to report her for child abuse if she ever left. Because he had proof. She was beating the kids. And what she had to say about that, she said, I thought, if I hit them, I'll hurt them less. If I let him do it, it will hurt more. I feared the day when my little ones got old enough to talk back. Another trafficker says, I told her that no one else would want my sloppy seconds. That she was used up goods and was worth nothing. The survivor says, no one else would understand who wants to marry a prostitute. Here's another comment. I made her afraid of leaving me. He threatened suicide. And she says, I felt like he needed me and it would be my fault if he killed himself. So I had to stay. Another one, he says, I told her I would kill her. And she said, I believed him. Now that Pimp said, I threatened to hurt the people that she loved. And that is the very real one. And the survivor said, I knew he was capable of, the, capable of this. I would do anything to protect them. The abuse was a small price for me to pay to keep my family safe.
Another comment a trafficker said is, I laughed and told her about men who had violently hurt or murdered their hoes when they tried to leave. She said, he threatened to take me to their house and leave me with them, to burn me, to douse me with gasoline. I knew they had done it to others, so I was afraid. I could go on and on. So why don't they leave? I think that answers that question. There's an anonymous quote that is so real in what we're looking at, and it says, We live in a culture where all children, all people are not free. Therefore, we do not live in freedom. Again, we're in the land of the free, home of the brave, but yet many are not living in freedom. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A comment he says our lives begin and end the day we become silent about the things that matter so it's our job if we see injustice it's our job to help and do something about it so my story <laughs> how did Garden Gate Ranch come about In Mark 10, 45, it says, Jesus came to serve, not to be served, and then to give his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. And that's a mandate on my life as well, is to serve that population of people. So how it all happened. Um, through uh, 2010 through 2015, our family went through five years of hell. <laughs> five years of one life-altering event after another. A an event that when it, was, when it happened, our normal of yesterday was no longer our new normal. We had to readjust our life. We went through five years of that. And during those times, there's defining moments. And if we're listening, sometimes some of us are harder to hear than others, but if we take notice of some of these defining moments, the Lord can use them and it's very powerful. So one of the life-altering things that happened and um, a defining moment for me was in 2011, our father passed away. And I remember after the funeral and everybody was gone and I'm sitting on the back deck and it was spring and I looked, I literally moved my chair to look straight east. And I just sat there and I said, Lord, let's just be done with this. Just split the eastern sky, blow the trumpet and send the cavalry. Let's just be done with this. And that's, I truly felt that way. And I'll never forget, as soon as I said that, Holy Spirit said, you will never leave until you do what you are called to do. And you will never stand before me and use your husband, and then he said another name, as your excuse. Now, I have a great husband, so don't. But I was in, um, I was hurt, and I won't go into details at all because I don't want to, but I was hurt deeply in a church setting by church leaders and then felt forced to stay in that situation for a long time and so I'm very sensitive to Holy Spirit and I hear God but it became uncomfortable staying there and hearing God and again my way of dealing with things sometimes is retreating and I remember saying to the Holy Spirit one day I said okay I'm more spiritually mature than my husband is. I'll wait him out. Thirteen years later, I'm sitting on the back deck of my house, wanting to be done with life. So I was forced, and you know, I didn't really realize it until later, but it was like, because I said to the Lord, I said, okay, then let's get on with it. What am I here for? What am I supposed to do? 
What was I born for? God puts seeds of greatness in every single person. But what do we see? Do we see those seeds of greatness in each other? And I see, I did see, seeds of greatness in other people easily. But I never saw seeds of greatness in me because I knew me. I knew everything I'd been through. I saw a failed crop. It's like, how could God ever use me? So that was a day. I felt like you to see that picture of that cat hanging onto the end of the rope. Yeah. <laughs> that, I, that was me at that moment. It was like, okay, I'm hanging on. You got to help me. You got to show me. You got to. And I instantly just. I mean, it was just like an immediate decision. But I realize now the Lord used that as a hook because my motivation was I still want to be done with this thing. I still want to be done with this thing called life because I know it's so much greater with you. So my motive was, okay, let's, we'll give, let's do it, but only because I want to leave. So a couple years after that, and the, so many things happened. I mean, my mom got a brain aneurysm and it ruptured. My foster daughter had brain surgery. She was pregnant and she couldn't have surgery. Uh, mom lived through that. We got her through all of that. And two months to the very day that she moves in with my brother, my brother's killed in a head-on car collision. I mean, it was just one hit after another. And I was like hanging on for dear life. And so in January 2013, is another defining moment. If, all of those weren't, but um, I'm driving to, my mom lives in Newton and I had moved away from there, I moved up to the Des Moines area and I'm driving to Newton to see my mom and I was happy. I felt like the weight of the world had been finally lifted off my shoulder for a while and uh, not that we're ever meant to carry it, but um, listening to praise and worship music I wasn't thinking anything like, let's, be, let's just get out of here type of thing, you know? And the Holy Spirit interrupted my worship music and says, don't you realize that if I allowed you to come home now, you would never have the crown to lay at Jesus' feet? And he started speaking to me about our life here on earth it's to fulfill what he spoke before the foundations of the world. And the only thing that's going to make it to heaven is the things that he's asked us to do. And the jewels that get put in that crown, that's our reward. That's the prize at the end of the race. And it's not even for us. It's so we don't go empty handed. It's so we could lay down our life, a, a crown of jewels resembling our life and lay it down at the feet of Jesus to tell him his blood was not wasted. So my mental of, uh, okay, let's do this because I want to get out of here, changed that day. It's like, okay, I want to leave earth totally empty of absolutely everything that he has asked me to do. And I still didn't know what that was. Excuse me a second. So fast forward, June 2014. So we're still in this five year icky season. June 2014. The worst crisis to hit my husband and I personally happened. And I had no idea how long it was going to last. Of course, we never want it to last overnight. And seven months into it, I remember sitting in my prayer room. And I said to the Lord, you know, you talked about surrender, total surrender. And that's what happened that day. Because for seven months, I'm sure I was 
begging God, I was crying, I was, you know, telling him how I wanted this to look at the end of all of it, right? And I sat in my prayer room that day and I said, God, I am so done with praying about this. I'm so done of crying. My heart is broken. It's like I am just so done with that. Because at this time I'm 55-ish around there. And I just said, Lord, you have gotten us through so many life-altering crises. Every single one. We're still standing. Yes, amen. Even if we're crawling in the dirt of the mess, we're still yes. standing for Christ. Yes. And I said, you have gotten us through all of this. I said, you've got us. And I said, I want to know what's written in my book. I want to know what you wrote. When I was still a spirit inside of you, we live and move and have our being inside of God. We are a living spirit inside of a living God. And there's a day that God says, it's your time. We as little spirits are like, oh, send me, send me. I want to go be a redeemed spirit. And one day God says, okay. So I, don't read, I want to read uh, Psalms 139, 13 through 18. For you created my inner being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Yes. It's not a failed crop. No. He says we're wonderful. He purposed for us to be there. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place of the Most High. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me, for you, every day was written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Where were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Think about that. He thinks about you so much that it is more than every grain of sand on this planet. Again, our, we have a hard time getting, it's a spirit thing. We can't understand it up here. It's a spirit thing. For I wake and I am still with you. So I really started pressing in. What's my purpose? What am I here for? There has to be more. You know, and I can list this whole list of stuff of what I'd done and who I was or what I'd, you know, accomplished. And none of them were fulfilling. It's like there has to be more. So I say, I had the audacity to ask God. It's like, you know, he's asking, he's waiting for that right question. I always say that. He's always waiting for that right question to answer it. And I had the audacity to ask God, what's on your heart? Who can I help for you? And at that very moment when I asked that, I sensed his presence so strong in my room. And I felt as if he wrapped his arms around me and he engulfed me into his heart. And he took me into the secret chamber of his heart. And he started downloading on me, to me about human trafficking, and I truly knew very little. I had heard the term, and that was about it. And still was thinking prostitution was different. And all of a sudden, I felt his pain. And then I felt their pain. Then I started hearing their cries. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking for me. They don't even think I'm worth fighting for. They look right at me, but they don't see me. Will anybody ever 
come, will anybody ever help? After I kind of got my breath after that, I heard the Lord say, the fight won't be easy, but it will be worth it. I said, okay. What I didn't tell you earlier was that January, that same month, at the very beginning of the month, I was at a conference down in Texas, and this gentleman that my husband and I had befriended at the conference, you know how we are, we're little herds, we go to the same spot all the time. And uh, he said, the Lord has a prophetic word for you. And so he spoke over us and my cell phone was all crackly and there was a lot of noise and I didn't capture it. But one of the things he said was, God is asking if you will partner with him on an amazing journey. And you don't have to know how to do it. You don't have to know any of it. He's already provided it all. And he will, he just asking if you'll partner and I said yes and my husband said yes we had no idea what it was so we had said our yes and he used that yes so that day in my prayer room after I went through that experience my heart was broken for what I discovered was my mission field my heart was broken for young women whose basic rights have been denied them, whose dignity has been stolen, whose voices have been silenced, whose spirits have been crushed, and whose souls have almost ceased to exist. I started to weep for women that I had never met, and I haven't stopped yet. So we talk about evil. Evil's real. We all know evil is real. But I want to tell you courage is real too. Yes, it is. It takes courage to go on living after a sexual abuse. It takes courage to want to live after trauma. It takes courage to hope that things could possibly get better. It takes courage to ask for help. And it takes courage to accept help, usually from total strangers. It takes courage to trust again and to love again. It takes courage to fight and do the hard work that it takes to get your life back. And it takes courage to get your voice back to tell your story. Something I realized, you know, when you're you live in a, a so-called protected environment and not exposed to a lot. You just think whatever you lived is normal. And uh, in my journey of researching about sex trafficking and the trauma piece of it and what happens, I discovered that People that go through sexual abuse, that kind of trauma, give up their will to live. And I didn't realize that that's why, ever since I can remember, I wanted to be with Jesus and I didn't want to be here. I wasn't suicidal. I think, mom, I don't know, preached to us that if you kill yourself, that's murder and you'll die and go to hell. And I didn't want to take that chance. So I would never, you know, would, would do anything. But I always had that secret desire to be gone. And it wasn't until I was researching this that I realized that's where it came from. Because I was inappropriately touched by family members and family friends. I had an attempted rape at the age of 13. I was raped at 14 and twice at 15. You think your life isn't worth anything. So I've said yes to the Lord for working with as many of these courageous women as possible. These brave women. Very brave women. And remember earlier I said 2% ever find freedom? 
That number's not good enough. That day I was overwhelmed and the Lord reminded me of the starfish story. And I usually have a prop of a little starfish. And I'll just share it really fast. Everybody probably knows it. But I, I, he, I, was, I mean, it's like, what am I supposed to do? I'm a real estate agent. I'm a grandmother. You know, what am I supposed to do? And he reminded me of the starfish story. And in a nutshell, this older gentleman would go take a walk on the beach every morning before he would start writing. And the night before a storm came in and filled the beaches full of starfish as far as he could see to the right or the left. And he's walking down the beach and he sees this little girl from a distance and she looks like she's dancing. And when he gets close to her, he sees what she's doing. And she's reaching down and she's picking up starfish and throwing them out in the ocean as fast as she could. And he comes up and he says, little girl, what are you doing? And she looked at him like he asked the stupidest question. And she's like, well, I'm saving the starfish because the sun's going to be up and they're all going to die if they don't get back in the water. And he said, do you really think you're going to make a difference? There's thousands of starfish. And she reached down and she reminds me of Sarah because with all that energy, she reached down and picked up her starfish and threw it out in the ocean. She, and she, but she looked at it and showed it to him. And she says, for this one, I can make a difference. And she threw it as far as she could. So I think I was hyperventilating probably, which is why he had to remind me of that story. So I went on a learning journey. And during that spring, that's when Garden Gate Ranch was birthed. Every time, I mean, it was constantly on my mind. And I pray about that population of people and what I was to do. And I, he was telling me about a residential facility and was giving me all of these things to do. So who is Garden Gate Ranch and what's our mission? Garden Gate Ranch is a non-denominational Bible-based Christian organization providing assistance, resources, and training for the sexually exploited. Providing a pathway to hope, restoration, empowerment, dignity, and purpose. Garden Gate Ranch was birthed out of a heart of compassion and a stand against biblical and social injustice. Just hearing the silent cries of those that are trapped compels us to do whatever it takes to get her off the street into safety. These young women don't need Garden Gate Ranch just because they're victims of sex trafficking. But she needs a place like Garden Gate Ranch so she can realize that she has more than what happened to her. Because what happened to her does not have to define her life. Because God's word is what defines her life. What does he say? She's valuable. Yes. She's priceless. Yes. She's loved. And she was born on purpose for a purpose. Yes. She has a future and a hope. Yes. She just needs the space and the time and love from people who will believe in her until she can believe in herself. Amen. So Garden Gate Ranch's mission is to offer her that pathway. A pathway to hope, to restoration, tools for empowerment, dignity, and purpose in a safe, faith-filled environment. Our focus at Garden Gate Ranch is not sex trafficking. We will not talk about sex trafficking all the time. She will have to deal with that with her independent counselors and therapy. But our part, and that's just how she gets there, sex, sexual exploitation, sexual violence is what gets her through that door. But our focus is to help her discover who she really is and what she wants for her life. Why did God at that time take that little spirit and put it in the womb of that woman? What did he speak into that spirit and we know everything God speaks comes to pass. Yes. What did he speak in that spirit that he wants her to know? So that's our goal. So we have several phases. Um, phase one and two we are working at very uh, extensively. And then there's a phase three that I see down the road. So we don't really talk a whole lot about it, but I'll mention it briefly. So phase one is the pathway house. And it is a, a shelter safe house for women 18 and over with or without their children, no questions asked. 
I get a phone call in the month of June, I got phone calls that equivalent 12 young women who needed a place to live, who needed off the streets. And we've had so many phone calls and before I can hang up the phone, call another safe house and make arrangements to get to her, a new boyfriend shows up, puts her on a bus and they're going to grandpa's house. Really? Probably not. So she's going to enter the doors, no questions asked. We'll start unpacking her life after she gets there. But we want to get her off the street. We don't want to put, leave her out there for another person to take advantage of her. So this program is a 45 to 60 day program. We're going to evaluate where she's at. It's basic shelter, basic needs, uh, clothing, medical attention, and uh, connect her with community resources such as treatment, counseling, job opportunities, and future housing. And also offer her continuing restoration in another facility. I don't like to say long term. I wouldn't want to go to long term. <laughs> so I call it continuing restoration. And again, these are her choices. We have to offer her the, and let her find her voice. So phase two is the ranch house, and that's the continuing restoration. And if our home doesn't appeal to her or isn't what she uh, fits, then we are in communication with we're collaboration with a lot of other homes that we can uh, hopefully find that place for her. Um, and that is as long as she needs it. It could be six months, it could be three months, it could be two years. She will be the one to indicate that. And that one is going to be strictly for women 18 and over that have a child with them, are expecting a child, or they have a children with a family member or maybe the state care in hopes to get their child back. In that program, we have seven pillars to her pathway of restoration. Uh, pillar one is physical needs. That's pretty simple. Uh, the second pillar is medical and psychological. The third is spiritual and emotional slash psychological because those kind of go hand in hand a lot. And that will, I'll break that down a little bit. That's counseling, personal group and family with a certified licensed counselor, uh, spiritual guidance with Bible studies, uh, therapies, lots of therapies with the licensed therapist uh, for some of these, um, equine therapy, art therapy, dance, creative writing, journaling, drama, music, culinary, pet, gardening, exercise, sports and fitness, play therapy, EMDR, sewing, jewelry making, candle making, pottery. She needs to be able to have fun. And just, you know, when you're busy and you're having fun, you can kind of let go of some stuff and things will come to the surface. And then of course they need those professionals that know exactly what they're doing when they're in a counseling session or a therapy session, like the EMDR and the uh, counseling. The fourth pillar is coaching, so that's social formation. We have a certified coach. Um, and that's to help develop life skills, parenting skills, financial planning, um, learn healthy boundaries, learn healthy relationships. Um, our fifth pillar is legal services. We will outsource that um, and work with uh, attorneys that will help these young women if they need to go through that. And then our sixth pillar is education, um, GED if they don't have it, vocational training, and helping help her get into like DMACC if that is her desire. And our fifth pillar is social development, and that's with a licensed social worker, and that would be like family education, job training, and social inter inter integration. Can never say that right. <laughs> so anyway, so our location is Central Iowa. It's a rural setting. I can't, you know, we can't really give out the address, even though we don't have the address right now. We do in our hearts and in our heads, but my name's not on it yet. Um, so we know where. We're going. We're just waiting for the phone call. I believe it's coming today. Anyway, <laughs> um, so what, what we are, what I, I know that God has said, it's going to be a large home. We're going to have outbuildings, space for ministry uh, buildings and staff housing, um, horse barn and arenas inside and out, open spaces, gardens, outdoor activities, timbers for trail rides, walking paths, prayer and reflection paths, and a pond. And before we actually open 24/7, we're gonna are we're working at now developing a day program that we can help other ministries 
and help women um, that just maybe want to come in for financial peace or some of those things. So, remember the starfish? Remember the little girl? Let me tell you the rest of that story. Everybody, anybody remember Paul Harvey? I mean, my age, you remember. You probably don't remember. Well, he, used to, he was this newscast, he was this news, whatever. Uh, and he'd always talk about all of these different things. And then he'd always leave you hanging until the very end of the show. And then he says, now for the rest of the story. So now for the rest of the story. Remember the little girl when she picked up that starfish and she said, for this one, I can make a difference? And she threw it as far as she could into the ocean. Well, the old man looked at the little girl and he thought about what she had just done. And he was inspired to join her. So he started picking up starfish and throwing them into the ocean. And soon many others joined them and started throwing the starfish into the ocean. And before the sun came up, all of the starfish were saved. So that says we all have a place. We all have a responsibility to help people that are in these kinds of situations. And we all can make a huge difference. And together, we can make an amazing impact for the kingdom of God. Yes. And so that's where you all come in. To pray about what is your spot. Where is your place. And I'd like to leave you with one more thought. So as we gather with our families for holiday dinners, football games, birthday celebrations. Or we go on vacation. Take a moment to consider the thousands of young women and young men and children that are being sold every single day, rented out in our communities, right in plain sight. I, for one, won't turn my back on them, and I pray you won't either. Let's make a difference. All for the love of one person. Let's make a difference. Thank you. That's all we have for the formal program. Uh, we'll have lunch downstairs. Um, Sarah, uh, from our professor, and Eric provide all the food. Um, everything today is just our gift to you. Um, again, all of your monetary gifts will go to Frank Gate Ranch. And afterwards, we're going to have time for crafts and fellowship hours for you guys to can stay. So. And I'm doing a little thing during lunch. Yes. Yes. <laughs> anyway, you can all my. Um, in there too. Uh, it's in the oh, oh, Sorry, oh, let's see. They might be here. I'm missing a page too. Maybe I. Is it the Proverbs? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that. Susan, I think I'll exchange for the Starline. They're probably in there. The largest one is my favorite. Sure. That's yours. Okay. There you go. There is no one. 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 Yeah. Oh.